Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. It is one of those things where you prep, you prep, you prep, and then it kind of goes out the window and it becomes a sort of spiritual experience, you know? But those things are in there somewhere. And that's the fun sort of magical part of acting. It's like, there's not really like a right or wrong way to do it. Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of In the Envelope. Happy summer. How's everybody doing? Now that Emmy nominating is over, to be clear, we are very much still in Emmy season, but Emmy nominating is over. We're going to take a quick break from TV contenders to highlight a buzzy new film, right when buzzy new films are premiering on the actual big screen. Today's guest, the voice you just heard, is Riley Keough who I think of as kind of a emerging maybe queen of indie film, also horror film, which we got to talk about. I think this is a really great story of how to forge your own path through the industry and become, you know, well-known without getting penned in into one thing, or as we like to say or talk about it backstage, pigeonholed. Riley is the eldest grandchild of Elvis Presley. Her mother is Lisa Marie Presley. So while this is someone who kind of grew up adjacent to the industry, surrounded by the music industry, her gut has always pointed her towards acting, and she held on to that. It's really cool to hear about it. You may know Riley from her Golden Globe-nominated role on the first season of The Girlfriend Experience, which we did touch on, particularly in reference to an emerging theme on this podcast sometimes, how to portray intimacy on camera. That is a relevant subject, given the film she is starring in, which is called Zola, and it's out June 30th from A24, Janiska Bravo, and Jeremy O. Harris. I think it does need some context before we get to this interview. Uh, Zola is based on a Twitter thread, which resulted in a Rolling Stone article titled Zola Tells All the Real Story Behind the Greatest Stripper Saga Ever Tweeted. And Riley Keough plays Stephanie, the uh, stripper and prostitute who took fellow stripper Zola out to Florida for an epic, wild two-day, let's say, adventure. Um, And from an acting standpoint, it's just such a fun, bonkers role because there's so much nuance and problematic issues which Riley gets into. And I just think it makes for a terrific interview about constructing characters and craft, you know, how to find a character in relation to yourself, artistic license. This kind of has it all. And Riley was so generous with her whole process. So let's take a quick break and then get to this interview with Riley Keough. This podcast is, of course, brought to you, listeners, by Backstage. Listen, aside from all the great inspiration and tips and all of that stuff we offer for free, like this amazing podcast, Backstage also gives you access to incredible casting calls all over the world. That is why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you're curious or if you're an actor yourself and you really want to jumpstart your career and you're ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here in this very episode and use it, go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E. That's, again, 30 days completely free to try backstage where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start browsing the casting notices, and start applying to jobs because who knows, maybe one day I'll be interviewing you. Again, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. Riley Keough worked as a model before pursuing her lifelong dream of acting, appearing in The Runaways, Mad Max Fury Road, American Honey, It Comes at Night, The Lodge, and with Steven Soderbergh in Magic Mike, Logan Lucky, and season one of The Girlfriend Experience. 
She's recently starred in The Devil All the Time and Janiska Bravo's Sundance hit Zola, based on an infamous Twitter thread. Here is the great Riley Keough. Um, hello, Riley. Welcome. How hello. are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing okay. Um, has there been so much? Have you just been doing so much in the lead up to this movie? I have, and I'm really excited about it because I'm like <laughs> trying to. I don't know. I'm just feeling really grateful at the moment. I think after COVID, like, and I've just had a really crazy year. Just. I really appreciate everything so much more. And yeah. I'm really like, I don't know. I just feel really appreciative of, of the response to Zola and mm-hmm. how, how much people are like excited about it and that it's kind of, you know, I'm, I don't know. I'm just finding it. I'm, I'm having a different experience, this film with press and a different relationship to it. And, and I'm really kind of taking it all in instead of looking at it as kind of like, um, Oh, I'm just going to work. Got to do my job. Yeah, you know? good. Yeah, yeah, and it's because that's not always the case, especially when like um, a movie premieres at Sundance and doesn't come out for months and months and months. It means that you're talking about it forever, but yeah. you you love talking about this one. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I love talking about it, and, and I how love, great that it's in theaters. I know, and I love that. That's something I really love is that we kind of get to be a part of this like sort of cinema rebirth thing so cool. that happened you know and i think people i definitely took for granted so many things before covid and going to the movies is like i'm so excited to go back to the movies you know and yeah. I, I i yeah so i'm really i'm really thankful that we get to be a part of the, a part of that and oh, kind yeah. of coming out like right when this like this the there's a little hope and 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 People are excited about life and again. And, and so, yeah, the timing for me is actually, I really, I think it's really good timing. Totally. I um, I have yet to go back to the movie theater and I'm, I, I'm planning, like, want it to be a really good film. I feel like Zola would be a great first movie theater film after a year of not going. I think it is too. I think it's. <laughs> You know, I think people always say every movie is a theater film, but and you got to see it in the theater. But I really feel that way with Zola. I feel like you want that experience, like you want the big screen and the loud sound. You know, experience is the word. I feel like I experienced this movie. Yes, (laughs) I don't think it's not a movie you really like get the ideal experience in watching on a small screen. I think. Sure. Totally. Um, and I'll, I'm going to ask you all about it. There's a lot of like even thorny questions to talk about with your character, yeah. ca- quote unquote character. But um, we are backstage. Are you familiar with backstage at all? Like, did you ever use backstage for casting notices? I I, I am familiar with backstage. Yes. Yay. Yes. Yeah. Because I we loved you know we loved that the craft and career advice, yeah. but also I want to ask you about your whole journey through the biz. I mean, why initially, why acting? I think it was just something I always knew I was going to do uh, from a from a really young. I just I was always filming everything. Mm. I always was playing pretend and, you know, I would wake up and kind of go outside and play that pretend that I was something, you know, like I, I was kind of as far back as I can remember doing that. And I think in hindsight, it, I think that, you know, that's you know, a sign of a young child actor, maybe. <laughs> but I Absolutely. think, I think that, you know, it was just, it just, it was natural. I just knew that that's what I was going to do. I knew I was going to be in film and I knew that um, I wanted to act. I definitely had like a hesitant, I, I was, I was, I grew up in LA and everybody mm-hmm. here is acting. So I had right. this sort of, uh, I, I kind of waited until I was 18 to tell people that I everyone knew I wanted to make films. Like I would film everything. I would edit, you know, I would make all my films act and all my friends act for me and make these Mm -hmm. like movies at my house and make horror films and edit them together. And, you know, so everyone kind of knew that I wanted to do that. And, but I kind of felt like I didn't want people to know I wanted to act because I think I was afraid to fail a little bit. Definitely. I think I was, I, I knew I always wanted to act. I was a little scared that, 
if I said it, then I could jinx it. And then maybe once I said it, then if I couldn't do it, then that's embarrassing or something. You know what I mean? So I I kind of didn't really tell people that I wanted to act um, (laughs) or or, till I was about 18. And because did you kind of know kind of growing up in the biz or adjacent to the biz, like you knew how hard it was to make it as an actor? I knew how hard it was. And I also... My mom always said to me growing up, you know, she was like, if you're going to do something, you need to be really good at it and work really hard at it because she kind of, her viewpoint was, you know, when you're a child of a famous person, people aren't going to take you seriously. So if you really want to do something, you have to basically work your ass off and be really good. And so I definitely felt that pressure. And you've kind of spoken about this before, but I wonder... I'm so fascinated by how artists are made and like um, you've spoken about growing up both on your dad's side and your mom's side. They split up when you were quite young and you grew up all over the place. And it's been said that that is what creates an artistic imaginative mind because you've had to exist in so many different worlds. Is it safe to say that, (laughs) does that inform the early beginnings? I mean, probably. I love when people ask me questions that I've never thought of, and I'm like, yep, that's it. <laughs> but I, but I'm <laughs> like, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I definitely grew up all over the place and with all kinds of people. I think mm-hmm. that too. Like, I, I've had kind of my life experience probably isn't what people would think it's been. I've kind of sure. had a lot of different, I've, I've, it's been an adventurous one for me, you know, mm-hmm. and I've, I've kind of had relationships with all different types of people and um, and it hasn't, you know, it's definitely been a, a colorful one. And I think definitely that has to do with uh, what, or creating who I am as a person and also uh, as an artist, mm. you know. So cool. Yeah. Well, and so kind of before acting, it was, there was modeling. Was modeling more of like a um, you were not as passionate about it. It was just a stepping stone on the way to acting well, or I had this like very weird, very clear kind of plan in my mind as a kid. And I, I always just, I was like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and make some money. But like, that was my first, I just like, I need to try and make some money. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm going to go to school and then I'm going to graduate school. I'm going to go to film school and then I'm going to do movies. That was like my mm-hmm. plan. And I was like, I'm not going to act until I'm 18 because I don't, want like I just had this like I oh because I want to live my life and I want to be a teenager like I just knew these things oh that's good too yeah and um I don't know where that came from that was just like this sort of internal um knowingness of of my kind of life plan I guess and and so there's just you know how some people just say I just knew that this was going to happen like I just knew that I needed to make money I knew I needed to live my teen years out and not be sort of in in film or whatever or in the public eye and, and then start working when I'm 18. And that's kind of what I did. And I, I modeled modeling was an opportunity that came to me Mm -hmm. and, you know, it was, I was a child and they were like, you know, do you want to do this and you can make money? I was like, definitely. Like I always had this sense of wanting my own, uh, my own stuff, my own money, my own, um, I had, I, I, I was, kind of had a really strong work ethic and I wanted to um, do my own thing. And so, yeah, that kind of was an opportunity that came up that was like, hey, you can do this. And I was like, amazing. Like, of course, you know, Um, but it wasn't it it wasn't ever really what I wanted to do as a career. Um, Right. And are they related? Like, did that give you almost on camera experience, maybe? Uh, You know, I didn't do I. I can see how they could be related for some people. I the only thing that um, that I can think of was we, I was doing a commercial f- when I was about thirteen or four, fourteen or maybe fourteen or fifteen, and somebody said to me, "You know, you should be an act actress." And I kind of in my mind was like, "I'm gonna," you know. <laughs> but you weren't speaking it out loud. Yeah, 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 and I and I just was like, "Oh, thank you." But I I think maybe that was like you know, those little moments when you're a kid, when you're like, that means everything. You're like, yeah, Yeah. you know? Um, Yeah. And so then I've, I've wanted to ask, I've been such a fan for such a long time of yours, especially just looking at your resume of like, I think of you as such an indie film actor, and I don't know if you think of it this way, but you've barely done any 
if any, um, major, you know, films from major studios or projects from major studios. Yeah. Is this on purpose? <laughs> do, do you think of independent film as this thing that that's what you, that's where you want to work? I think it was on purpose in the, in the beginning. I, I mm -hmm. really like, you know, I definitely, when I was 18, 19, 20 was like, I want to do art house cinema. That's all I want to do. I only want to do this. And then as I got older, you know, it was kind of like a good film is a good film kind sure. of, a thing, you know, and whatever form, however that, uh, you know, it was like that sort of young kind of like, I only want to do, you know, something really serious and cool and mm. whatever, whatever. Like I only want to do like festival movies or, you know? Yeah. I remember I was like, when I was like 22, I had a moment of being like, oh, well, Mad Max, it is like a big studio film. Maybe I won't do it. I'll do anything now that I love. You sure. Know? A role <laughs> is a role. A role is a role. And, yeah. And you can't, you can't, you know, you can't, I don't know. That was pretty short lived. And then I kind of ended up just in that world a lot just because of, you know, you make friends and you have relationships and you end up doing more friends with people. And that's kind of. Right. Road. That's the other thing is you get siloed for better or for worse. But I, I also think there's a, um, what about horror? Yeah. Like is, is horror acting maybe a different style of acting than non-horror? I think like it's all different. And, you know, there was a while where I kept getting asked to do like scary, thrillery kind of horror movies and everything kind of, I don't know, comes to me in waves sometimes like I'll get like really similar things kind of really close together and I'm like what am I putting out into the universe that's telling <laughs> everyone that I should be doing this three times in a row you know right but uh I love it all I love movies I love I love all kinds of movies and I'm excited to do all kinds of movies and I think that um I've definitely been put in this sort of box of like uh art cinema and like that's awesome and I love that but I'm not it's not like a, it's it, it actually it, it was intentional when I was 19 but that was short-lived and it's kind of just ended up that way like I, I if you would have kind of asked me like the career I would have wanted mm -hmm. it would have been like being in like the Harry Potter movies you know like that's <laughs> like that's like what I what I wanted for myself kind of you know like I love fantasy and like um yeah, it's, it's just interesting how things kind of work out. And so the pigeon, is it pigeonholing? I mean, is it... Um, yes, it is pigeonholing. And you don't mind? I don't mind it. I'm kind of like grateful. I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been able to do some really cool stuff and work with some amazing people. And um, I could be pigeonholed as something worse. You know, it could be like... Oh, yeah. You know, like it's... I feel like I'm... It's... It's not a bad pigeonhole and I I'm think I'm just grateful I'm grateful that I've you know been able to work with that directors that want to work with me I mean sorry the directors that I've wanted to work with want to work with me you know sure yeah well and that was actually my other question was the story of you meeting is it safe to say you and Steven Soderbergh are are each other's muses are you collaborators I mean I love him so much so I hope so <laughs> <laughs> I hope he likes me too. <laughs> I think he does. I mean, you guys have created some really cool and just completely different stuff together. But yeah. how did you get Magic Mike? I think it's safe to say Magic Mike is probably the biggest of your early work. Magic Mike like changed my life because... Really? I, okay. Well, I met Steven. So I did. I went on an audition for Magic Mike and Steven wasn't there. It was just the casting director. And okay. I'm really bad at auditions. That's a whole nother conversation. But Oh, I'm going to ask you all about it. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to, I want to put that out there. So other people, you know, listening, don't feel bad if they're oh, yeah. at auditioning. Cause it's like, probably it's, it's yeah, it's not my thing. So I, it was a, it was a kind of a non-traditional audition. It was like, we did a little audition, a scene, but then it was more like an interview and then like mm -hmm. a kind of in character interview kind of a thing, which I'm, I can do that, you know, like that, gotcha. that, that works for me. And and um, and then I booked Magic Mike from that tape, and and then I worked on that, and then I met Steven, and then Steven put me er, he gave me the girlfriend experience from right. Magic Mike, and then Logan Lucky, and you know like the girlfriend experience was 
hugely mm-hmm. shifted my career and yeah. um and put me in a situation like where I was then like could make choices and I you know had more options and you know so in that way like Steven totally changed my life sure and this is go- and this is going off of that this is a question <laughs> It's, you don't have to answer this, but it's a question we ask for for those who have acted on camera in terms of intimacy. Yeah. And it's something that you have a lot of experience in with girlfriend experience and now Zola. Mm-hmm. So um, what is the advice? Like really, what is the advice, especially for female actors who are maybe uh, playing intimacy on screen for the first time? Right. Uh, well, no, I think the first thing I would say is you are allowed to say whatever you want. And I think Mm -hmm. as actresses, women, uh, and as women, sometimes there's two, there are two separate ideas. Like as a woman, sometimes you're going like, you're used to people pleasing a little bit and making people comfortable and taking care of people and just being like, it's okay. It's okay. You know what I mean? And then also as an actor or actress, you're also always wanting to do your job and you don't want to upset anybody and you're it's also you're especially if it's like you're starting out and you don't want to you you don't feel like you have enough agency to like say i don't want to do that and so that is something that you know it's the most important thing is knowing that you can say hey i don't want to do another take like i'm uncomfortable or you know like i i just knowing that you have you have a voice and that's so much more supportive now you know, and there's HR and there's, you know, there's that if that's not happening, if you're not feeling comfortable, like people could get in a lot of trouble. So you have that, you have the right of, to say those things. So um, if you're feeling, you know, uncomfortable first and foremost, and then secondly, like it really depends on the character. Like if you're having, doing a sex scene where it's uh, uncomfortable and the character's uncomfortable and the character is, like I, I always just try and like really go through what the character is experience, experiencing, you know. And so, I've been lucky in that a lot of the women I'm playing are very liberated when they're when they're being sexual, and they're mm-hmm. very kind of powerful. And I'm not always that way, but you know, if you're if you're really trying to get lost in your character, you can kind of put their shoes on, and for those five minutes, you're not whatever. I'm not Riley. I'm. Yeah. I'm Stephanie, you know, and Stephanie doesn't feel, Stephanie doesn't feel awkward. So you're kind of hiding behind this, like, you know, like your character doesn't feel that way. So hmm. as much as you can, you know, I guess it's transforming just like in, in, in any other scene, you know, it, it's a different situation if you're doing a sex scene where you're, you know, being abused or something, if it's like a darker, you yeah. know, scene, then of course that's going to require like a lot more support and, um, yeah. You protecting know? yourself protecting yourself yeah. yeah and knowing you're and knowing you're and you know you're on the clock and people are losing money and there's <laughs> always this sense of like go 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 and yeah. that freaks people out it, it makes you feel like okay i have to do it i have to do it right now and there's a sense of urgency and i have to get it right and like stop and you can breathe and you can yeah. take your time and like you know just learning those things took me years to be like oh i can just like pause here yeah. like, I, like the whole world's not going to explode if this movie set like has two more minutes you know sure of me sitting here you know <laughs> so those things i think and you had to kind of learn that on the job totally and i definitely have been in situations where you know i'm like okay i'm doing this scene and there's like a lot of coverage there's cameras there's a lot of setups and like i don't mm. love doing this and maybe it's uncomfortable and you know, and you kind of, you, you, I guess I've learned over the past few years to, that it's okay to have a voice. And that's, that's partially because of the movement in our, in our, in the film community of like supporting women, you know? Yeah. Like you said, like even maybe the time of filming Girlfriend Experience, there weren't a whole HR people in charge of making sure you're not uncomfortable. Absolutely not. There, there weren't. And luckily I had, you know, two directors I had, I felt very comfortable with, but Mm -hmm. you know, even then, like even now compared to then, there's just so much more attention and awareness on, okay, she's naked, like give her a robe in between takes. And Mm -hmm. not that that didn't happen before, but 
there's just a lot of attention on it now and it's yeah. really nice you know mm -hmm. and intimacy coordinators like was there one for zola there wasn't um oh. there or, or maybe there was i don't think there was uh -huh. um I also like when I'm working, I'm so like in the other per in my characters. Okay. That space that sometimes like there could have been an intimacy coordinator on set and I don't remember. <laughs> That's exactly what I want to ask you about though. So like, okay, are there things you do every time for every role to get into that character? And like you're saying, like, even if it's just a five minutes of ignoring Riley or, or I don't know, not ignoring, but yeah. suppressing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's like, well, it's different for every role, you know, it's okay. never this, it's never the same, uh, preparation for me. You know, it's like some things that work for one character don't work for the next one. And I have to just improvise and feel in my heart, like what's going to work for this. There's some roles mm -hmm. where it really helps me to learn my lines, like so well to where, like, you know, I could say them in five, you know, like speed read them like uh, that yeah. works for me sometimes. And there's other characters where, it helps me to loosely know them, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's always kind of a different process for me. Um, I definitely will say that like I prep, the more I, you know, the, the more I prep, the better my performance is. Um, whatever that prep is, you know? Um, right. um, but then it's like, you know, it, it is one of those things where you prep, you prep, you prep, and then it kind of goes out the window and it becomes a sort of spiritual experience, you know? Mm -hmm. And but those things are in there somewhere, I think, you know, like, mm -hmm. the, and, and that's the fun sort of magical part of acting is like, there's not really like a, there's not a right or wrong way to do it. It, it is such a spiritual kind of uh, thing. Absolutely. That was pure gold. Yeah. And I feel like Zola is an especially apt example of, of everything you just said of like, there must've been so much preparation. She yeah. is a real person, correct? So she is there. Is, there is a real person. Um, there is a real person. Yes. Not named Stephanie, and you know the the film was based off of Zola's Twitter threads more than it was um, anything else. So it, right. it was very much like Zola's tweet thread is like the source material. So oh. it was it was very much about adapting that and and Zola's version of who this person might be. And then you have Janix's interpretation and Jeremy's of that. Mm -hmm. So it was like uh, Zola's interpretation of what went down, then Jeremy and Janix's interpretation of Zola's tweets and and who this person might have been, what she might have looked like, what she might have talked like. So <laughs> it wasn't like this, you know, like Janixa went around and got everybody's deep story and, and you know, made this like accurate completely to the word you know, it was it was very Got much it. based off of Zola's experience, Zola's perception of her, and and then so in that way there was like a little bit of freedom to create a character. Yeah, cool. Um, which is less pressure for me. I have played real people a couple times, and and it's really stressful. Sure. Like it, it's like you want them to be happy, and you want them to, you hmm. know, like for Taylor playing Zola, like you. She, it, it, there's this pressure of, you know, I hope she likes it. And, you know, and, and yeah. I didn't have that because I don't know, you know, it's kind of based off of a, a many lived experiences and the Twitter thread. So I had room to sort of play around and, and mm -hmm. make things up, you know? That's awesome. And so the Twitter thread obviously was, you must have read and reread that as part of your preparation or research, if that's the basis of all of this. But what else was there? There's the physicality, there's the look. Yeah. And those things help. So, you know, it's like, yeah, you kind of get this idea of the character in your mind or like they're kind of outside your mind. They're hanging out here and you are creating them mm -hmm. and, and, and you, and you figure it out and you're like, Hey, this is what her hair is going to look like. This is what she's going to talk like. This is how she might move. And then there, and then you step into them and then it's like a whole nother ball game. Cause you're like, Ooh, like, now I'm trying to be this thing I've created in my mind. And it's like, you know, it's such a weird process. But, Absolutely. Um, you know, those things are so helpful, like what her hair will look like, mm -hmm. what she will walk like, you know, in her clothes, how she carries herself, how, you know, uh, she turns her head, how, you know, like the way she speaks, the, her, her, her dialect, her, 
yeah. you know, all these things. And I think that that is my favorite part of acting is like the nuances and like, that's my favorite part of human beings is <laughs> watching people, watching people do things and, and like the way they eat or the way they move their hands or, and, and trying to implement those things into my sort of bank of like, oh, I saw this person one time who sat this way or who kind of yeah. embodied this thing. And, and those, and collecting all of that in life constantly has been the most yeah. helpful thing for me. It's like, important. and since I was a kid, just sort of like obsessed with watching human behavior, the way that people are saying their words. Sometimes I'll see someone do something really cool and like really try and mimic it or, or like um, remember it, like the way that they said a word or the way they stuttered or the way they yeah. swallowed or, you know, and, and just like keep that, I don't know, just like picking those things up, those sort of like very human Oh yeah, um, they, they kind of just go into your mind and then they come out in your work so at some point, like un subconsciously. Subconsciously or the actual mimicking. That's so interesting that sometimes it's like straight up, I'm borrowing sometimes this. I'll straight up, sometimes I'll straight up mimic people if they do something cool. Like my mom will say something in a cool way and I'll kind of like copy her and go, oh, that was sure. cool, you know? <laughs> totally. Well, and speaking of that, so uh, the accent. You worked yeah. as a dialect coach. I did. Correct. Yeah, I worked with a dialect coach named. Have Eric. you done that before for other roles? Mm -hmm. I have. I I worked with a dialect coach. I really, I'm really a stickler with dialect. I want to mm -hmm. get it right, and I want to get it right. Like, I don't just want to do a southern accent. I want to do that region. Yeah. You know, I want to do the accurate, you know, representation of that exact dialect. You know, so like. That stuff's really important to me. Um, and, you know, like I did that, this movie Devil all the time and mm -hmm. their accent, you know, was, it's like the border of two states and it's very specific and mm -hmm. the Ohio and West Virginia and, and, and where, what part of it she would have lived, you know, like that stuff is so fascinating to me. And so like, I, if I'm given the opportunity to work with a dialect coach or the film can provide that for me, it's like, I love, I love that. Mm. So yeah, I got to work with this woman for Zola um, named Eris Mendoza. And you know, the, the, her, my whole character is like appropriation, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's all just offensive. So she's this like demonic, you know, uh, person. And so cool. uh, so I, you know, that was sort of the direction from Janixa was kind of like, she really wanted to go there uh, with the, her dialect, with her hair, with everything. So yeah. then I would work with the accent coach and she would, you know, we'd run through the scenes and then I would um, send voice notes to Janixa and, you know, Janixa would be like, more, go hard, you know, go wow. further, you know, like she wanted to go. <laughs> further with it and so we got to this place where we were happy with it and it was kind of like figuring out riding that line of like not making it silly you know like of course this movie okay. is like you know it's it's hyperbole it's over the top it's mm. it's like you know it's it's theatrical but also wanting it to feel like she you know maybe she really speaks this way in her life yeah. and so that was an interesting like thing to try and do for me that I I was worried about like making, I never want to, I never want to feel like I'm playing like a caricature of somebody, you know? Yeah. And I, I think I see that. Like I saw, I agree that it's not a cartoon or it's not a caricature and it's not silly. It is absurd, but it's not silly. Exactly. Um, that's, that's, that was for me was the goal. It's like absurd is great, fine, but silly, yeah. you know, I didn't want to do that. Yeah. Cause I read that she just kept telling you to make it more stressful. Yes. The word. That That's really weird. fascinating. Yeah, more stressful. And I just love that you just described her. As, I, I really weirdly love actors just describing their characters just straight up. But yeah. you just said that she is appropriation. Not that she's appropriative, but yeah. that she is appropriation itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She is the sort of human form of appropriation. <laughs> yeah, she's like an incarn a demonic incarnation of, yeah, appropriation. So you did sort of think along the lines of demonic. Yeah. I mean, it was very clear on the page that she was yeah. the devil, you know, like that she was this like wild, 
you know, you know, how the devil comes in many forms, you know, like she was, she mm. kind of intoxicated, you know, Zola and made her come away with her. And she was this witchy yeah. kind of like Ooh. demon, you know, and, yeah. and, but then within that, you know, it's, it's so important and always so, my favorite part is, you know, you have to, you have to, like trying to get an audience to have moments of empathy. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you're playing a villain, you know, is like the best. It's it's a real, mm. you know, or not even empathy, but just moments of maybe she's not so bad. We mm -hmm. can't just dismiss every every person on this screen, mm -hmm. and they're not straight up demonic. Yeah. But they're humans that are demonic. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And. And that's reality, you know, there's yes. the thing that's so great about cinema and film is you get to spend time with these people that you would just so quickly judge and brush off okay. and, and sort of go like, oh, well, that's a this thing and, and that's a this kind of person. And then in film, you get to spend time with them. You get to see their vulnerabilities and you get to and it, you walk away, hopefully having a um, an experience that, you know, hopefully not being so judgmental and, and 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 if you are fine but just like you know oh maybe maybe you know oh i hate this girl actually uh she's our uh you know like all of that yeah. stuff that's that to me is like such a cool thing that film does with people right and so and so you as an actor are not ever judging your character you're saying i think that when you're playing somebody like you have to try and find empathy for them um for me, I do anyway, um, and it's something I really practice in my my life outside of acting too, you know. And so I think it's a really cool sort of drill in um, in empathy, and mm -hmm. you don't have to like them, you, you, mm -hmm. but you do have to be able to be compassionate towards their situations. And I think I think I think empathize, yeah. Yeah, like, see, because the non-judging your character thing is something I've heard so much, and it's kind of like, but don't we as people judge ourselves? Well, like, that's the thing. That's the line that's really weird, is that you, like, you know, I, there's a lot of people don't love themselves. Yeah. You know, so... <laughs> they don't, I don't have empathy for themselves. Yeah. They don't have empathy for themselves, so I don't know if you need to, like, love your character, but but you need to embody them. And connect with what they're upset about and what they're sad about and why, you know, and it's really challenging sometimes, especially when it's somebody that you're like, oof, like this is nothing like me. And I, I wouldn't, you know, I would never do that. Or I would, this is, yeah. you know, it's, it's definitely like a interesting experience. Sure. And it can be exhausting. I mean, are you also... Are, how in character are you in between takes? Not at all? So I think like there's an aspect of me that's probably much more in character the whole time I'm shooting than I realize, you know? And I think oh. that you kind of you kind of embody their essence and and not, not and I don't mean like in a method quote unquote way. Mm -hmm. But like you do I do find myself walking different and sort of having an air a different sort of you know, it does, you, you do take it home with you to a degree. And I, I, I do anyway, you know, and I, and it's, it's not like in these, I'm not like going home being like, I'm Stephanie and, and I need everyone to call me that. It's not that kind of a thing, but it is, you go, you, I change, I go into their sort of, their, their persona kind of rubs off on me the whole time I'm working. Hmm. And that can just be, like I said, the way I'm walking or the way I'm move, my body moves or, um, that kind of a thing, but you know, and, and the funny thing is, on Zola, we actually would kind of go into character, at least before the takes, in between takes, like we kind of would stay, mm -hmm. sort of in character. Like it, it was all of us were kind of like we'd play around with each other, and and we were kind of like it wasn't like um like what people would say like a method thing where we were all like talking to each other in character, but we definitely would like uh, in, uh, embody our characters more on Zola than I have on other films for sure. 
Sure. And do you have like a post a role ritual? Like actors have talked about how they, like you just said, take their role home with them. I also, it's so interesting to then look back and realize, oh, I was a little bit more in character than I thought. Like oh, what do you do to then shed, like shed it? It's so funny. Like I'll watch videos from times that I was doing different films and I'm much more in character than I, than like you said, than I remembered, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, it's kind of cringy. I'm like, Sure. going around the world and I'm not being myself but that's another thing that's really weird about being an actor is that you do you, you're constantly being other people and if you're working and you're if you're so lucky to work a lot mm-hmm. you kind of lose yourself a little bit because mm-hmm. you're you know, who you are is like me when I'm in the trailer and and who is that you know and right that became really apparent to me this last year of not working yeah. I was like who am I? You know, I've played women who are very liberated and that's been a really liberating experience for me, you know? And like, it's very, like, there's definitely good things you take from it too, you know? Yeah. It is therapeutic if you, if you emotionally kind of set boundaries and protect yourself. You had, you, and that's the other thing is like, I, you do have to protect yourself. And I think that there's this sort of, there's so many schools of acting and there's definitely schools of acting where people are like drawing from things and sort of torturing themselves. And <laughs> like, for me, that's not a workable, um, technique. I, sure. I have to protect my mental health. And I think that your job, when your job is to, uh, transform your mental health <laughs> kind of in like, and play around with those things, like you need to protect yourself, like in my yeah. opinion. And, um, so I'm very careful with that stuff. You know, it's like, hmm. I'll cry. If I can't cry sometimes, I'll just, you know, there's there's times when I can cry and then I can't. And then I'm like, I can't do it anymore. Like, I just can't, you know, I'm not going to go, you know, work myself into an unhealthy, you know, I don't know. Like, I, yeah. I do have, I have boundaries where I'm like, okay, if I keep going on this, I'm going to be in a dark place when I go home. And I don't want that. And I, and I think when I was younger, I definitely would be like anything for the scene. I'll do anything, Hmm. you know, and I'll torture myself. And as I get older, I'm like, I, you know, I'm much more protective of my heart and my, um, my emotions. And yeah. Yeah. You just learn how to get there without, without having to do those things. Yeah. Totally compromising your, like you said, the mental, that's so interesting. The idea of changing your mental health for your character's mental health, like, whoa, that's heavy. It's totally heavy. Yeah. And people don't, I don't think, um, you know, take it seriously because it's like you're acting, but it's like you're, Mm. you're throwing yourself into uh, grief or sadness or, you know, and it's not fake. It's real, you know, and it's, it's real and that's why it's good, you know? Sure. It's a weird, it's a weird one for sure. Like your body doesn't know that you're fake crying if you're crying. No. (laughs) No. And you don't either sometimes too. You know, I have scenes where I like, I start crying and I can't stop after they cut because you open things up, you know? Yeah. And so you do have to, and sometimes it's so nice and therapeutic to do that, you know, right. to be able to, but yeah, I think, I think you have to protect yourself too. It's a trippy uh, profession, truly. Yeah. Um, This is great. Thank you so much, Riley. I, we have these questions that we ask everyone. They're very actorly questions. Cool. Um, such as, where did you get your SAG after card? My card, like actual card. Yeah, or like, what project was it that got you in there? Oh, um, it was the Runaways. Okay. When cool. I was nineteen, I think. You were nineteen, and it was a—I mean, a pretty, pretty big indie film, right? Mm-hmm. That it was, was your a foray. Big, it was a big indie film with Kristen Stewart and Dakota Fanning and that's that's what got me sagged sagged up sagged up (laughs) awesome um and then uh auditions I said I was going to talk about auditions (sighs) I know it gives gives me anxiety talking about them (laughs) it does I've had very few people on this podcast say oh I love auditions let's Uh, talk about it please tell me who they are because I need them to help help. fully (laughs) totally they're good at auditions is there a worst audition horror story that you would share? I have so many. Like, I don't <laughs> even know where to begin, honestly. I, like, I'm surprised I have a career, 
I, I'm, <laughs> I'm the worst. I'm so bad. And I just get so nervous and, and I get panic attacks. Like I have, I, I really bad anxiety. So it's just like, and it's really the main thing that triggers them is feeling like I'm stuck somewhere or I can't get out of a conversation of a dinner of an airplane. And so like auditions are very much that like you walk in the door, you can't just be like, hold on one sec. I got to take a call, you know? Right. And so, um, I also like, didn't know I had anxiety for a long time because I, you know, I grew up in a, in a time before those things were like widely talked about. And oh, so yeah. I just was like, why can't I do this? Like, I just feel like I'm out of my body and I can't, you know, that's a great point. Yeah. I can't function and I can't, and I'm too, I like, I leave, like I leave my actual body when I'm in that room and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm surely not acting. I'm like just saying the words and trying to get out of there as quick as I can. Right. Um, I I had an audition. Um, I had an audition one time where I uh, just, I'm just bad. Honestly, like I just do really bad, weird acting. Like it's like, it's like not even like I'm in there. I'm just like, I just, I get in the room. I want to get out. I just say the words and I, and then I, then I, you know, freak out. But I, I did one where like the minute I went, walked in the room, I didn't remember like anything. I couldn't remember oh. any of the words and I had to look at my sides and I like kind of just did the whole scene like looking down and then looking up but then I knew it was bad so then I was like not even trying anymore and then yeah. they were just like cool you know <laughs> like thanks and then I did another one uh where I just had the same thing. I just like knew, I just like walked in there and just had, and knew what was going to happen, knew I was going to have a panic attack. And then was like, I need to get out of here and I'm just going to say these words and leave the room. And so like, I like, you know, walked in, said the words and just went and left. Like there was no acting involved. I was just saying words. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then I think they like called my agent and were like, um, is she like, I don't think she really wanted to be here and just got like really bad feedback. I've gotten so much bad feedback. And, and then I did another one. I did, I did one quite recently, not quite recently, maybe two years ago Okay. where I was really sick. And this was like pre COVID when you still had to go to work sick. <laughs> and oh, sure. I, I had a fever. I had like 102 fever. I did not want to go on the audition. Um, hmm. And my agent was like, you have to go. It's the only day they're doing it. You have to go in. And I was so sick that I like couldn't focus on what was happening. I just did a really bad reading, you know? Yeah. It's mostly, it's not like I have like, my horror stories are like, I go in there, I do really badly. And then they tell my agent I did a bad job. <laughs> and that's kind of what it's been like. But um, within that, I've had a, a few, enough good, good auditions good. that have, you know, that, that have kept me going and given me a career. So I have right. managed to show up and it's random when I'm, when I'm good, you know, it's so sure. random. That is so interesting that it's, it's uh, a crapshoot. <laughs> it's a little crapshoot. And the, the, the weird thing is it's only with auditions. Like I've never been nervous in my life when I'm acting, you know, I don't, on I'm set. not on set. And it's not yeah. nervous as much as it's actual anxiety. It's like I get like yeah. a panic attack. I start like leaving my body. I can't, I'm like black out. You know, I'm like, I don't know what's happening. And I don't get that on set. You know, on set, I feel like I'm like the most in exactly where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I feel the most like comfortable. It's that thing why we keep acting. You know, it's like you feel like you're at home and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And cool. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. No, that I really, I think that um, there's a lot of listeners that need to hear that, everything you just yeah. said. For sure. It's horrible. And it's yeah. like, and, and, and it's such a, it's in this industry where you're like constantly going, what's wrong with me? Why didn't I get this? You know, why okay. didn't, or in com constant comparison. And it's yeah. just, it's really brutal. That's, that's it's the nail on the head. <laughs> That's totally why I have the utmost respect for actors. I mean, you do, you have to like, if, if there, I do too. I have such a respect yeah. for actors because I'm looking at them going like the shit you've gone through, oh, yeah. you know, to this, the strength you have to continue this, you know, it doesn't, 
I tell friends that all the time. I'm like, this isn't like normal. The the amount of rejection, the amount of um, self doubt, and and all of that that you're going through. Like, it takes a yeah. really strong person to keep going and not give up. Totally, yeah. Um, gosh, thank you so much. Um, the other question that we always ask, last question, what is one performance that you think every actor should see and why? Oh my God. That is so hard. I actually have a list I think in here. An actual list? An actual list. That's so cool. Um, okay. I would love to know what your like, yeah, your influences are. This is, this of- is, this is, not, this is just something, these are just things that I, put together to watch for just for before I go into my next show and sure. it fade down, fade down away in network. Okay. It, I, the other day I was on Instagram and I posted like, what are your f- favorite female performances of all time? And so I just got like so many cool recommendations. Oh, that's um, a great way to do it. Yeah. I know. Right. So, uh, a lot of people say Jane Fonda and Clute, oh, okay. um, mm-hmm. uh, which I actually watched before the girlfriend experience, like the director um, oh. had me watch that as a sort of a reference. Um, mm. Oh my God, there's so many. Um, All About Eve. Yes. I, I love the performances in that. Um, I hate these questions because there's like thousands, you know, and people. And you'll think like, of all of them. And you think of all end. of them after the podcast. And, I, and <laughs> people are like, what's your, you know, a woman under the influence? You uh-huh. know. Um, God damn, there's so many. There's too I mean, many. Those are great. The, so the list that you make, is that in preparation for the role that's coming up? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of just like, before I do any film, I'll just yeah. watch, like, I'll watch, um, I'll watch females that are very, like, free in their performance. Like, those are the, those are the kinds mm. of things I like watching, regardless of what I'm playing. It's just, like, inspiring, you know? Yeah. Um... And that sort of what used to be this like rarity, which is like a fully realized female character that, ah. you know, definitely you're seeing more and more of um, now, luckily. Yeah. Like cooler and cooler things, you know? Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. It comes back to what you were saying about you want to play liberated and it's cathartic to play liberated because you, you yourself are not necessarily that no. liberated. I think that, like, all of us need that. And when you get to play, like, somebody that's, like, that, you know, open, it, it does rub off on you. And you, and I have, you know, there have been benefits from this. From this crazy career. Crazy career. <laughs> um, this is all great. Thank you so much, Riley. Thank you for having me. This is so fun. And I'm so excited for um, the film to come out. It's crazy that it's, in my mind, it's been out forever, but... <laughs> Me too. I, I, I know. I'm, I'm so excited and I, I just hope everybody likes it. And I, and I hope that, that I think audiences will like it. I sure hope so. You never know. So, well, yeah, let's pray. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. And, um, thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for having me. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hey everyone, Christine McKenna Torella here. Today I wanted to chat about intimacy on screen and safety on set and auditions. We talked a little bit about this during Time's Up the episode where Tina Chen came on and talked about the Time's Up Foundation. It's a really great episode. If you haven't got to listen to it, highly recommend. But I thought because Riley has been cast in a number of projects that have involved nudity in sex scenes, both with Zola and the girlfriend experience, I wanted to remind you about the importance of safety and intimacy on set and you and your comfort level as an actor always being honored. 
So let's first start with auditions. So no physical contact or uh, nudity is appropriate at the first audition. The only exception to perhaps physical touch is if you're a dancer and they're uh, asking for an adjustment. Sometimes that's given physically. And even at that, someone should ask you if you are comfortable with them placing hands on your leg, your hip, your arm, right? So always you have the right to ask, to say no. Even then, no intimate touching or just robing should ever be required. And if that is asked of you, that is a red flag. If in doubt during an audition about what's being asked of you, ask why. And if it doesn't seem right, say no. Before getting on set, confirm the extent of intimacy or nudity that is requested, including costume in the script and therefore relevant to the role. The following is stuff that I'm pulling from the Time's Up Foundation free guide on this. You can download it. It is multi-pages long. And if you want to look into this further, if you have a project that has nudity or sex involved, take a look. But evaluate your boundaries and consent. Communicate these boundaries in writing to the person requesting the audition through your agent if you have one or via email to the contact at the casting office. If you have representation, that person can take it up and support you and advocate for you and let them deal with the contract things of your of your boundaries. But if you don't have an agent, then you have to advocate for yourself. Evaluate your boundaries about this type of material by having an honest conversation with yourself about what you're comfortable with in this type of setting, right? So consider what type of kissing are you comfortable with? Is it closed mouth only or open mouth, open mouth with tongue? What type of nudity are you comfortable with? No nudity at all, which should be completely fine. Wearing a a swimsuit, wearing a G-string or pasties, nude underwear. Is there any part of your body you do not want to show? What level of comfort do you have about being touched, right? Are there places you don't want to be touched? And where are you comfortable with touching other people? I mean, I'm blushing just thinking about it, but I think it's so important to think about all of the possible scenarios because you want to have already thought through what your yeses and nos are before you get on set. I think it's also incredibly important to ask, will there be an intimacy coordinator on set? And if something comes up during the shoot that you have not previously consented to or you are uncomfortable with, speak up. Don't do anything that doesn't feel right. There are additional resources. So uh, we have multiple articles on this topic. Just search the term intimacy coordinator on backstage.com. And we actually had a panel on a few months ago on intimacy on set with coordinators that were, it was really valuable. It's free on our YouTube. And another resource other than the Time's Up Foundation would be IPA, which is the Intimacy Professional Association. That's a network of professionals that um, deal with intimacy coordination of all types. Here are some casting highlights of this week. So in Atlanta, there is a casting for a YouTube series looking for a host for a popular international children's book brand. The pilot shoots in mid-July in Atlanta, and they're seeking hosts that excel at presenting and engaging with a single camera. They have good ad-lib skills and can work with lightly scripted framework. In New York, they're seeking people for a video campaign that had to retire during the pandemic because their industry was shut down or a variety of reasons. Check that out if you know someone that recently retired and might be interested in being involved in a video campaign. Finally, there is a nationwide open call for a project called Empire Waste. They're casting a bold, hilarious look at body positivity and uh, being confident in your own skin. Looking for the leads in this project, which are all plus size women and non-binary folk. They're very diverse in what they're looking for. It was for kind of 18 to 21 people that can play teens take a look. All the details are on the site. As always, we have hundreds of casting calls for every type of actor in every region on this site. So head over to backstage.com to check those out. That's all from me for now. Break a leg in your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. In the Omni
Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.